Thank you. Wow. You guys really know how to make a guy feel good. I appreciate that very much. All right, so I have a short bit of time with you, so I want to get right to the point. No matter how successful you are, a lot of the circle of champions I saw up here, how many still want to be much more successful than you are right now? Okay, so I have, a, I have an important question for you, and that is, why are you not right now more successful than you are? Because let's just be honest with each other. Your current results are really only a fraction of what you're truly capable of achieving. That you are far more talented, you have far more potential than your current reality. Why are you only living up to a fraction of your potential? So I asked that question to our three million readers in Success Magazine on stages all over the world. And so I want to clear up the, the most common answer that I hear to that question of why people are not more successful than they are right now. Because it's a myth about what's limiting their greater potential. So how many people here had a really nice, normal, happy childhood? How many? Wow, most of you. Huh. Well, good for you, because my childhood sucked. Does that translate? Mierda. Bad. Not good. Okay? My parents divorced when I was uh, 18 months old, and my mother, she didn't, she didn't want me. Uh, so when they divorced, she just handed me over to my father. As a matter of fact, when she first found out from the doctor that she was pregnant with me, her response was anger and disappointment. And so when they decided to split up, she just very easily handed me over to my father. Now, you have to understand that my dad was only 23 years of age when I was born. And he had just moved from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area of California to what seemed like the middle of nowhere, which was Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the desert, where he took a job as a overworked, underpaid university American football coach. And so it was just he and I out there by ourselves, and he really didn't know what to do with me. As a matter of fact, this was his parenting strategy after I was born. He would just shove me in the corner of a couch, barricade me with pillows, and then put headphones on my head to try to keep me quiet. If you see the stunned look I had on my face, I had that most of my childhood. And you learn very early on, being under the parenting of my father, that you just kind of had to fend for yourself really early in life. To say that my dad wasn't the nurturing type is almost comical, right? I mean, he was, uh, we affectionately referred to him as a bit Neanderthal, and he parented like he coached football, which meant that uh, there was no whining, no crying, no excuses, uh, lots of yelling, and lots of cursing. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you, if you remember the movie Full Metal Jacket, but that, that could have been my father's twin, Sergeant Gunnery. And growing up in his household was like growing up in his boot camp. And my father, he was, he was infamous for one of his coaching philosophies, and that was no matter how hurt a player got on the field, they were not allowed to come out of the game. So one time in the middle of this American football match, this linebacker just gets smashed in the middle of the field. I mean, just devastated. And he wobbles to the sideline and he begs my dad to take him out of the game. And my dad grabs him by the face mask, clenched teeth, spitting through it. And he says, not unless you're showing bone. And he pulled back his shoulder pad, not from his neck skin, was sticking his collarbone. So anytime I got really sick and I, I, I begged my dad to stay home from school, he'd yell from the other side of the house, what? Not unless you're showing bone, exactly, and I have to drag my sorry butt out to school. And so when I was um, age four, he married my step monster. I don't know if that was gonna translate, but I did not mispronounce that. And they went on to have two other children. And because in her eyes I was of the other woman, she didn't like me very much. And she did everything she possibly could to try to ostracize me from the family. So I, I really was what is called a uh, redheaded stepchild. And you can also see that my, my father cut my hair, which I think I suffer more emotional trauma from than anything else. 
Now I have to tell you, this morning I stand before you, having gone through this very dysfunctional childhood is the reason why I can stand before you this morning as the very high functioning achiever. And the reason is this, because I had to get over these issues of abandonment is the reason why I am vigorously self-reliant. Because I grew up under a football coach for a father is the reason why I am so driven and ambitious. Because you had to achieve to get any love or any attention from my father is also the reason why I am so goal-oriented and persistent. You see, a lot of people look at their past as wounds that they need to heal from, when in actuality these are muscles that you developed that allow you to do the extraordinary things that ordinary people just can't do. How, how, do, you, how do you build a muscle, right? You put a muscle under incredible stress and strain, incredible stress and strain. When you do that, you're actually tearing the muscle. And in rest and recovery, it grows back bigger than it was before, so now you can lift heavier weights that you couldn't have before. So the first key message that I want to give you here today is your adversity is your advantage. And that your past, whether you had a terrible childhood or whether you've suffered from some difficult experiences in life, you should cherish those as your advantage because that was the training that gave you the muscle development to go do extraordinary things that ordinary people just can't do. So what I'm here to talk to you about is how to ignite the principles of the compound effect. How many people have read the book, The Compound Effect? Okay. So what I want to do is to try to help you ignite those principles, okay? To pull them out of the book, lay them before you, and give you a roadmap about how you can accomplish any goal that you have set for yourself. So we could take all the wonderful things that you learned this whole weekend, all the great aspirations, goals, and desires you've got, and then give you a plan so that you can achieve anything that you can conceive. So the question I'm asked a lot is, you know, is why did I sit down to write this book? And when we took over Success Magazine and put it back on newsstand in 2008, I was looking at the culture around us and society and trying to figure out what's stopping people from being more successful. Why do people who have a sincere, passionate interest to learn what it takes to be successful, why are they not finding success? And the reason is this. We are constantly bombarded with an ever increasingly sensational marketing gimmickry with claims about how you can get rich, get fit, get younger, get sexier, all overnight with very little effort for only three easy payments of $39.95. And these com commercial marketing gimmicks are taking people who really want to learn, I want to provide more for my family. I want to send my children to the great universities. I, I want to provide for a future for my parents. And they're pursuing these answers and they're constantly being derailed and distracted, tricked, fooled, bamboozled. And so I decided I just wanted to clear the clutter, bring us back to the truth, demystify what it really takes to be successful. And so that's the reason why we sat down to create, let's just get back to the very foundation in which all success is built on top of. And here's the reality. There is no silver bullet. There's no magic pill. And for God's sakes, people, there's no freaking secret that's been buried for 2,000 years by some covert society that's only been unearthed recently for worldwide revelation. So now you could just sit on your couch and imagine checks coming into your mailbox. <laughs> Do that too long and they will come and take your couch and you off to a safe place where you can't hurt yourself or others, okay? No, there is no secret. Here is the truth. Success is earned. If you really want to know the secret of success, okay? 
I published Success Magazine. I'm going to tell you right now the secret to success. Here it is. Success is earned by hard freaking work. Hard freaking work. If you ask the circle of champions up here, how did you do it? How did you get to the top? How did you become so successful? Their answers are always going to be three words, hard freaking work. There's no other way around it. If you've desired to be a circle of champion and you haven't achieved it, I'm telling you the only thing that's stopping you is not enough hard freaking work, okay? Now, the truth, the truth, if we wanna talk about truth here, the truth about the process of earning, not winning, not arriving, but earning success, that process is in itself very mundane. When you go back home and you start building your ACN business, <laughs> it's mundane. What you're gonna do day in and day out is mundane. It is unexciting. Nobody's gonna video film you and make a new fantastic reality TV show as you build your exciting new ACN business. No, it's unexciting. It's unsexy. No matter what the magazine articles look like, it's unsexy. The process is frustrating. And sometimes it's even gut-stomping, heart-crushingly defeating. But hey, that doesn't make for interesting books or exciting infomercials or riveting movies. So instead, we're paraded around with all these other visions of what it takes to be successful. But those are just shiny objects and not the truth. So I want you to truly, today, stop it. Stop looking for the quick fix for success, happiness, and wealth. There's no shortcut. There's no cliff notes. There's no quick fix. You are going to walk through a minefield day in and day out of hard freaking work because success is earned one day at a time. Every day you lift your head up off the pillow. You're going to decide whether that day you are a success or whether you are a failure. You're either moving forward or you're falling behind. One step at a time, every step you take away from the bed as you walk through your day, you are either going in the direction of success or you're going in the direction of failure. It is one decision at a time. All day we're presented with hundreds of decisions and every one of those decisions is like a chisel mark on a, marble of, uh, uh, on a slab of marble. And at the end of the day, you're either going to end up with the David or you're going to end up with a pile of rubble, depending upon the decisions you've made throughout the day. It is one phone call at a time. You know the phone call you didn't want to make, the one that makes you a little nervous, makes your palms sweaty? Every one of those phone calls is determining whether you will be a success. One meeting at a time. Remember Donald Trump said yesterday the meeting he didn't want to go to? That one meeting changed his entire future. Every single meeting you decide to or decide not to go to determines your future. And in the end, you can never own success. I congratulate the circle of champions, but do not stagnate too long in your victory because you can never own success. You can only rent it. And the rent is due every single day. Circle of Champions, tomorrow you better get up and get after it all over again. So it's never in totality. Now how many of you have ever been to a personal development seminar or read a book or read the back of a CD program and it said transformational results in 90 days or less and at the end of 90 days you didn't have transformational results. Anybody have that experience? Yeah, me too. Well, what's wrong? What happened? Well, here's the reality. It is not what you know that determines the results in your life. See, that is a myth. Knowledge is not power. It is the potential of power, but it is not power in and of itself. Power is only created in what you do with what you know. Look, there are a lot of really smart people who are geniuses, who are broke because knowledge is not something you can take to the bank. 
It is only action that produces results. In America, we've got this statistic. 44% of doctors who tell you how poor eating and lack of exercise will kill you, and these people, 44% of them are overweight. Or as the philosopher Morpheus said, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. So as I give you this morning, I'm going to reveal to you the fundamental keys to success. When I give them to you, I don't want you to say inside your head, oh, I already know that. Instead, I want you to ask yourself three questions. Number one is, are you doing that? Because you might know it, and you've known it for a long time, but are you doing it? And the second question is, maybe you're doing it, but have you mastered it? In other words, is there still something in which you can level yourself up to get better at it so that now that might ignite the results in your life. And the third most important question is, you might know it, you might be doing it, but would your results prove that you've mastered it? In other words, would your waistline prove that you've mastered these principles? Would your business prove that you've mastered these principles? If we called your spouse and asked them, have they indeed mastered these principles of success? And if you're saying to yourself, well, <laughs> just don't call my spouse, you see there's still something here yet to learn. Because as Samuel Johnson said, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. So even if I just take some of the things you already know in the back of your mind, bring them to the front of your mind, clear all the rest of the clutter out, and make it clear, step by step, exactly what you've got to do. Now maybe what you know applied can ignite the results that you've always been capable of achieving, but got too distracted and were too inconsistent to follow through with. So that's what we're going to do here. I want to give you the operating system underneath which all success is built on top of. It's kind of like this. You could take the world's greatest software designed by the greatest engineers in the world, tens of millions of dollars invested in it. And if you take that software and you install it on a computer that has a faulty operating system, what happens? It's buggy, it crashes, doesn't operate to its potential. Now the user might make the mistake of thinking, oh, I know what happened. It's that terrible software. The software's the problem. No, 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 it was the operating system that was the problem. So this is what happens. People go to a seminar, they read a book, they listen to a CD program, and then it doesn't work. It's buggy, it crashes. And they make the mistake of going, oh, that book, that seminar didn't work. No, no, no. It was just installed on a crappy operating system, you, and that's why it was buggy and it crashed and it didn't operate to its potential. So what we have to do together here is, we have to get your operating system operating at world-class standards so that it is perfect in its execution, that its operation is world-class. Then we can layer on top of that the leadership software, the sales software, the circle of champions software, the parenting, the marriage software. And maybe now, for the first time, once installed, it actually will perform to its capability. So that's what we're up to here. Here's my goal. I'm going to lay out for you a system that, if applied, will enable you to set goals that when you walked in here this morning, you were too afraid to set for yourself. Now why are you too afraid to set the kind of goals that you're truly capable of but won't allow yourself to live up to? And I think it's because you can't see how it's possible. It just seems silly seems too fantastical. But I believe if I can show you an exact stepping stone process to achieving those great goals, that you'll finally, when you leave here, set the kind of goals that are actually consistent with your true potential. And my goal ultimately, the results that I want to see is 12 to 18 months from now, the person you become is unrecognizable to the person sitting in your chair right now. You have a much leaner, stronger, vital body. You have more intimate relationships with the people that you love and care about. 
You have a thriving ACN business and you're walking across this stage as a circle of champion. Those results are possible if you stick with me over the next several minutes. This is a working session. I'm not the only one working up here. If you really want to change your life, change the trajectory, find yourself on this stage, we got to do a little bit of work, okay? So you're not going to be able to get everything that I put down here. I know you're taking photos of the slides. I always promise ACN, because I love this organization and want to see it succeed, that I'll give you my entire slide deck, okay? I'll show you how to get the whole slide deck. I'll give you a recording, an audio recording of this whole talk so that you can listen to it. You can share it with your team, okay? I, I only ask, I only ask that you do not pub publish it publicly, okay? This is just for you, just for ACN, just for you and your team. So I'll show you how to do that in a second here. What we're going to do is we're going to rewire the lines of code in your operating system between you and any goal that you've got is this operating system. So line by line, we're going to rewire your operating system. So what is the root control factor? If we were to boil everything down to the most core controlling factor to all the results in your life, what does it come down to? Because here's what happens. We all come into this world exactly the same. Naked, scared, and ignorant, right? I mean, some of us a little uglier than others, but basically all the same. Naked, scared, and ignorant. And then after that grand entrance, your life is controlled by one factor. There's only one thing that will determine whether at the end of a life you end up living here or whether you end up living here. There's only one thing, one thing that determines whether you end up driving this or whether you end up driving this. One controlling factor determines whether at the end of a long life you end up lonely, despondent, and broke, or you end up in a marriage of 50 plus years of incredible intimacy and great bliss. Only one thing will determine whether you get to send your children to the greatest universities in the world, or no matter what it is that they qualified for, they can't go because you can't afford it. Only one thing will determine whether you get to donate to your charity, to your greatest heart's content, whether you get to travel the world in fantastic luxury. Did you all see the movie City Slickers? Curly said, it all comes down to one thing. Your whole life comes down to one thing. What's the one thing? Choices. Circle of champion answer right up front. It all comes down to choices. Right now, as you sit there in your chair, right now, right now, your whole life is nothing but the accumulated compound effect of the choices you've made up to this moment. Right now, your waistline is nothing but the accumulated compound effect of the choices you've made up to this moment the size of your business, your bank account, the intimacy of the relationships in your life are all just an outcome of the compounded choices you've made up to this point. So if we're going to change the trajectory of your life starting today, starting right now, we've got to go to where it, the control factor of it all begins and it all begins with choices. Choices is the first line of code in rewiring your operating system. So let's do it. What choices? Because we're presented with hundreds of choices all day throughout the day. What choices matter the most? Anybody here ever been bitten by an elephant? Well, what about mosquitoes? Anybody ever been bitten by a mosquito? Bill Gates says this is the most deadly animal on the planet for the human species. And it's also one of the smallest. See, nature provides clues. It's the little things in life that will bite you and kill you. So is it true about your choices. When you take a look at the seven billion people on the planet, a question I'm asked a lot is, we only get to pick 12 people to be on the cover of Success Magazine out of seven billion. And I'm asked, what do these guys do to become so successful? What separated them from everybody else? Well, let me tell you what they did not do, because this is what everybody thinks they did to get to the cover of Success Magazine. Success is not a result of some heroic feats. 
Nobody you see on the cover of Success Magazine did anything heroic. It is not because of some grand act of bravery. You know, you do not leap and hope that the net appears. <laughs> Don't do that. That ends in calamity. And they didn't perform any quantum leap. It wasn't just right place, right time, as Trump said yesterday. Yes, luck plays a part, but it only plays a part after you have worked your butt off. So it wasn't any grand act of luck either. Success is, if you're looking for the answer of what caused these people to get on the cover of Success Magazine, success is a result of small, seemingly insignificant, moment-to-moment -moment choices. The only thing that separates them from you is that accumulated compound effect of those little choices that created dramatic differences in results. Small little choices like at lunch, you're given a menu. And what is the menu? It's just a series of choices, right? Do you pick the hamburger and fries or do you pick the salad? Now you're thinking, that doesn't seem like that big of a choice. I'm telling you, it is. Small little choices like at the end of a long hard day, do you stop by the gym and put in a workout or do you rush home to catch your favorite sitcom? Small little choices like in the heat of an argument with your spouse, do you walk out of the room and say, I'm not going to deal with this? Or do you spin on your heels, say you're sorry, and choose to make a moment of magic? Small little choices like in a networking event, do you walk across the room and introduce yourself to that person? You're a little bit afraid to do so. Or do you hunker down in fear one more time? Small little choices like at the end of a long day, do you put in a few more phone calls or do you just simply call it a day? You see, these small choices add up to big, gargantuan differences in results. Let me give you a, um, a reference point in which to associate this with. If I were to give you a choice of a single cent, single penny, that doubles every day for 31 days, or a million euro in cash right now, how many people would take the million in euro? Okay, tough crowd. All right. Let me sweeten the offer here a little bit. A single cent that doubles every day for 31 days or two million euro cash right here today. How many people take the two million in euro? Okay, a couple more converts. All right, last offer, okay? Penny that doubles every day for 31 days or three million in euro right now, right here today. How many people take the three million in euro? Okay. Well, let's say that you were paying attention and you said, small things add up to big results. I better pick the small thing. There's a clue there. And let's say that you pick the penny, okay? But your neighbor, your neighbor at home picked the three million euro in cash. So now we're gonna start proceeding in life. We get five days down the road and your measly penny is worth 16 cents, okay? While your neighbor has three million dollars in cash and you can hear the parties going on next door, right? When you get 10 days down the road, your penny has become five euro and 12 cents. Not enough for a happy meal at McDonald's, right? But your neighbor is drinking champagne, eating caviar, having Robin Leach over for dinner, right? Now we get 20 days down the road and your penny is still 5,242 euro and they've got three million dollars in cash, three million euro in cash and partying like a rock star. It's not until we get to day 31 that we see the dramatic outcome of this compounding pity where your penny is turned into 10 million, 737,000 against their paltry three million. Now. What you need to know about this is this is the reason why Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. Because the, the, the math between day one and day two is exactly the same math between day 30 and day 31. Nothing's different. You just see the compound effect of it. And this is why I'm telling you right now this morning, compound choices 
are the eighth wonder of the success world. Because the same choice you make between day one and day two is exactly the same simple, small, easy choice at day 30 to day 31. But the outcome of those choices are dramatically different. Let me give you a for instance. Let's take three friends. Let's say they all start off exactly the same. Three ACN representatives are starting off exactly the same. But Scott here, Scott decides he's gonna try some of these things that he learns here this morning. And here's what Scott's gonna do. Instead of getting up every morning and reading the newspaper and seeing all the corruption, wars and crimes and scandals that are happening in the world, he's gonna get up and read 10 pages of a nice good book, something positive, something about success and achievement, just 10 pages. On the way to the office, instead of listening to the radio and hearing more wars, gossip, and, and, and conversations about other people, he's going to put in one of those CDs, something positive, something instructional. He's going to cut 125 calories out of his diet. Okay, that's a half a candy bar or small bowl of cereal, meaning he's not going to go on any rash diet. He's going to drink two bottles of water a day. He's going to park at the back of the parking lot and walk into the office. He's going to make a few more calls before calling it a day. And he's finally going to make that date night with his wife a priority. Okay? That's all Scott's going to do. Now, Larry, Larry's just going to keep being Larry and doing exactly what Larry's always done all his life. Brad, and I hope there's no Brad's like this in the room, but Brad, here's all Brad's going to do. He's going to start making a few poor choices, meaning he's going to munch on a little junk food at the office. You know, like a half a handful of chocolate-covered peanut M&Ms. That's it. He's going to miss a couple of workouts a week. He's going to drink more Diet Coke than water. Not good. He's going to move around a little less because he's sitting behind a computer all day. He's going to skip a prospecting call or two. And he's going to give the cold shoulder to the spouse a couple of times throughout the week. No big deal. Nothing dramatic, right? This is not going to be a Jerry Springer episode, just a cold shoulder every once in a while. So now if we take these three friends and these three different behaviors and we chart it out, five months down the road, these three friends look exactly the same. Ten months down the road, exactly the same. So now Scott, Scott's thinking, what's going on? I'm getting up every morning and reading this book and I'm listening to these CDs and I'm doing this date night thing with my wife every week and my buddies are just sloughing off and we have exactly the same results. You can see why people get frustrated and start giving up because they think it's not working. But let's just say he proceeds a little bit further. 20 months down the road, slight differences, right? Brad's starting to feel it in the belt a little bit, right? You really can't tell, but he can feel it in the belt. At the office, tension and anxiety start to set in. At home, apathy. Now the neighbors and friends, they don't really see it, but it started to set in. It's not until 27 months later that the differences between these three friends are dramatic. Let me show you. So Scott, here's what's happened to Scott 27 months later. He's read 47 books. Now you know that the average college graduate does not read three books the rest of their life and he's read 47 books the last 27 months on success and achievement, 465 hours bombarding his mind with success and achievement. Is that going to make a difference to his attitude, to his mindset, to his results? Dramatic. The 125 calories he cut out of his diet meant that he lost 33 and a half pounds. Do you realize that we can end obesity in the world if everybody just cut 125 calories off their base diet? over time. He drank 3,700 gallons of water. Those 2,000 extra steps a day meant he walked 900 miles the last 27 months, losing another 30 pounds. And those date nights with his wife, that got pretty exciting, okay? I had photos, but I decided to just show you the X's and O's. The couple extra calls that he made each workday meant that he made 1,860 extra calls that he wouldn't have made otherwise. If he closed 3% of those, which means he didn't learn anything from those books or audios, he added on top of his previous $50,000 a year income, 
an additional $279,000. And you know what Brad and Larry are saying? Oh, you're just lucky. So here's what Larry is doing. Larry's like most people in the Western world. They're treading water, falling a little bit further behind, becoming disenchanted, bored, apathetic, passionless, disengaged, and then they're blaming the government, right? Brad, here's what Brad's small, simple, poor choices did to him. That 125 calories he added to his diet meant that he put on 33 and a half pounds. Missed a couple of workouts, the Diet Coke, now he's in heart attack danger. Missed a few meetings, made a few less calls. He's about to be fired from his job and lose his home. The inattention and cold shoulder to the spouse means that apathy set in and he's on the brink of divorce. You see, small, seemingly insignificant, positive choices create extraordinary results. Small, poor choices over time create devastating results. By the way, if you want a copy of these slides, here's what you do, okay? And for the leaders that we talked to on Friday, I gave you some wrong instructions. So, by the way, everybody else here, if you text in, you can get the leadership talk that I did on Friday too, by the way. You can get an entire audio recording of that. So you just take that phone number and in the message, you have to put EU, EU comma, your name comma, your email address, okay? And then it will email you a link where all this is provided for you so that I can help you get this into your brain, your conscious, and into your organization so that we can help you achieve the kind of goals that you're interested in, okay? So there's the number to use. Please do it within, within 48 hours because then the page is taken down. Great. And if you didn't get the number, it's over here in the corner, okay? So now, if all of this seems rather easy, why is it that people still fail and still make poor choices? Well, here's what I want to warn you of. There's four traps that you will face. Outside of this conference hall, these traps are on the ground. At home, these traps are on the ground. At the office, at the shopping center, these traps are on the ground. So I want to point them out to you so that you can go, whoa, I got to step around that. Because people with good intention step into these traps and then they get derailed and then they wonder why they end up with no results and so frustrated. So here's the first one. At the moment that you're making a choice, the consequences, the outcomes, or the results are invisible. It doesn't look like it's having any impact whatsoever. So you can get faked out. But I promise you, I could change your choices like that if I had the power to take the space-time continuum and collapse it. Meaning, if you made a choice right now and I took the space-time continuum of that choice 15, 20 years out and I collapsed it and showed you exactly what the outcome was, I promise you you'd make a different choice. For instance, let's say at lunch you did pick the hamburger and fries and upon the first bite your chest explodes and you drop to the ground in a heart attack. You probably lose the taste of hamburger really, really quickly. Or let's say the next morning you woke up like this. Yeah, whoa, whoa, how do you get like that? How do, how do you get like that? One bite at a time, simple as that. Or let's just say, you know, you're out with your girlfriends, you didn't smoke, but they're encouraging you, like, I'll oh, have a smoke. And, you try it and you're like, ah, you know, I put it down. That doesn't seem so bad. I don't know what everybody's talking about. But the next morning you woke up like this. You probably wouldn't take another cigarette. Or let's just say, you know, you're a young kid and you try your first cigarette. You're behind the school feeling like a rebel. Your friends are going, wow, you're cool, right? It looks like a young James Dean. But let's say I could take the space-time continuum of 20, 30, 40 years and I could take your future self to talk to your current self about that choice, what would you say? Don't smoke another cigarette. But see, for, for decades, for years and years and years, it didn't look like anything was happening. It didn't look like anything was happening. And it wasn't until the last four or five years when the dramatic outcome 
of those choices made itself known. Or let's just say, you know, you promised your sponsor, your upline, that you're going to make three calls. You're going to talk to three people every day about the ACN opportunity, okay? But today, today you got a headache. You know, you got to make dinner. You got to pick up the laundry. You, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll make them tomorrow instead of today. And I take the continuum of that choice and I collapse it. And we call Donald Trump and you become fired. You're out of ACN. Your house goes up on the chopping block and you're under bankruptcy. That's what the continuum of that single choice looks like over time. Or let's just say, you know, you promised your spouse that you'd never go to bed angry. But tonight you're like, I just don't want to deal with this tonight. We'll talk about it in the morning. And you go and sleep in the guest bedroom. And I show you what that single choice looks like. And the next morning, you wake up to divorce papers and you got to look your little girl in the eye and explain why you couldn't make a different choice. You see, every single one of these choices has what you can also call a butterfly effect. Y'all heard of the butterfly effect? Butterfly flaps its wings one part of the planet and on the other side of the planet, there's a tsunami. This is what I'm telling you. One little itty bitty choice over here, 10, 15 years later, and there's a tsunami in your life, either positive or negative. So what do you do about this? Okay, what do you do about each of these positive choices you're now going to take? Well, the first thing you need to do is to just have patience. Even though you don't see the results in the moment, you have to know that the compound effect has been ignited. And every choice you make ignites it and fuels it. And it will stretch itself out over 10, 15, 20 years before it reveals its results to you. Second trap. When you start to change the trajectory of your life, that change is subtle and very, very deceptive. For instance, let's say that um, you're on a plane in Los Angeles, California, and that plane is headed towards LaGuardia Airport in New York. And while that plane is on the tarmac, its nose is pointed directly at LaGuardia. If the nose of that plane is off by only one degree, let me show you how far one degree is. From here to here. Did you see that? From here to here. In other words, not much. By the time that plane, one degree off, flies across the United States, it'll be 150 miles or 240 kilometers off its intended target, two states away. So here's what happens, okay? Here's what happens in people's lives. They're one day going along. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, they end up, they end up looking at themselves in the mirror going, <laughs> what happened? How did I get so fat? How did I end up divorced? This is the person I said was the love of my life. How did I end up estranged from the people I said were most important to me in my life? Look, here's the reality. You might not have done anything really bad. You might have only been one degree off. And that one degree traveled over 10, 15, 20 years, and now you're 150 miles or 240 kilometers off your intended target. So what do you do about this? Well, a plane has what's called a gyroscope in the nose. So it keeps itself on track. So no matter what happens, weather, traffic, it's redirected, the computer keeps locking on to its intended target. So it can fly all the way across the country and then hit the exact runway it wants to over on the other side of the continent because it has a gyroscope. So I'm going to show you a gyroscope you can use for your life before we finish up here. But I have to warn you, life on the ground looks a little bit more like this. Standing atop a double black diamond ski run. And let's say the goal at the bottom of the hill is uh, a comfy chair, warm fire, and a cup of hot cocoa, okay? And if you just run right at it, What's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to get ugly, right? So what happens is you start off and then you get hit by a mogul. And the mogul just pushes you over in this direction. Now, a lot of people end up 
just skiing off the mountain, right? Instead, you have to adjust. And you ski a little bit and you get hit by another mogul. And you're like, I see my goal, I have to adjust. And you'll notice, if you look at the line from the top to the bottom, you'll notice that you are off track more than you're on track. So what I'm telling you is, you will be off track, often. But the key is what? Get back on track. And the more time you spend off track, you'll spend more time coming back to the track. The difference between how long it takes for you to get from the top to the bottom will depend on how much time you spend off track. So the key is to get back on track. Here's the third trap, immediate gratification. And as a Western civilization, we are addicted to immediate gratification. We're trying to pleasure ourselves at every single moment. So let's say at the end of a nice meal, you're presented with a choice. Grandma's warm chocolate cake or a glass of water. What are you gonna choose? Well, what do you get if you choose the chocolate cake? Joy. You get joy, you get like this oral sensation of epic proportion, that's what you get. What do you get if you choose the glass of water? Nothing. Bupkis, does that translate? Nada. Right here, this is the biggest problem you will have in making good choices. Because if you make a poor choice, you're rewarded. If you make a good choice, you get nothing. And that is hard for our emotional and psychological selves to take. And we come by this addiction to pleasuring ourselves very early in life. So what you're doing all day is you're walking through this minefield of solicitations on your immediate gratification. And your ability to have self-control and to withstand these solicitations is gonna come down to a couple of factors. This is the great paradox that you have to understand. What gives you short-term pain? Having the glass of water, making the call you don't wanna to go to, to wanna call, going to the meeting you didn't wanna to go to, creates long-term pleasure. On the other side of this, what creates short-term pain? Going to the gym, saying you're sorry, creates long-term pleasure. Now my mentor, Jim Rohn, put it this way. He said, in life, you will suffer one of two pains. And right there, right there is great wisdom. When he said, in life, you will what? Suffer, man. You're not going to get around it. But you get to pick your suffering. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And as Jim put it, he said, the pain of discipline weighs ounces picking up the phone, going to the meeting, saying you're sorry. But the pain of regret weighs tons. Bankruptcy, divorce, heartache, loneliness. So as you're out there making your choices, ask yourself, pain of discipline or pain of regret? And that'll help you along a little bit. When I asked Oprah about this, about how she tried to control some of her choices, she says, you know, I realized that if I, if I made a good choice, I didn't get anything. I didn't get to have the chocolate cake, right? She said, so I decided that instead what I did is I got a miracle, okay? So at least I felt like I got a miracle. She says, first of all, if I didn't choose the chocolate cake, it's a miracle. <laughs> and she says, my whole goal throughout the day was to make miracles. And at the end of the day, I would just add up how many miracles did I make today? Meaning, how many positive choices that I didn't want to make, but I made anyway, did I make today? And if you start taking an account of when you, when you choose short-term discipline versus long-term regret, then you'll be on the right track. The last trap is this. What's easy to do, and everything I've talked to you about here is easy to do. The actual process of success is easy to do. Emotionally, it's very difficult. 
but the process is easy to do. It's easy to eat an apple a day, walk around the block for your good health, say you're sorry, make a moment of magic, pick up the phone and make phone calls, write thank you letters, drink glasses of water. All that's easy. That's the problem. It's also easy not to do. Because it's so easy, it's easily disregarded. You'll sit there and go, ah, and that's no big deal. And you won't do the easy things. And because you won't do the easy things, life will end up very hard for you. So realize there is a little bit of a trick in what's easy to do is the fact that it's also easy not to do. So I have a question for this intelligent audience. What do successful people and unsuccessful people have in common? Here's what they have in common, okay? They both hate to do what it takes to be successful. Successful people just do it anyway. You see, do I like getting up at five o'clock in the morning, leaving my warm embrace of my beautiful bride to go put on running shoes to go run out on the cold, dark morning? I do not like that. Do I like, at the end of a long, hard day, going into the gym and pushing around a bunch of lead weight with a bunch of hairy, sweaty guys? I do not like that. In the heat of an argument with my wife, when this time, maybe just this time, I know that I know I'm right. Do I like saying, honey, you're right, I'm sorry. No, I do not like doing that. But why do I do these things? Because that's what it takes to be successful. You see, I think unsuccessful people find it very inspiring to learn that successful people hate this stuff too, but they just do it anyway. I walked into the gym a few months back and I went and checked in. And when I was walking away, the front desk person said, hey, have fun. I looked back and I said, what? She says, have fun. I was like, fun? You think I come here for fun? I hate this place. I've hated every day I've ever come in here. She says, but you're here a lot. You don't like it? I said, no, I hate it. But I come here for discipline. I, you know, Muhammad Ali, the great world champion boxing star, right? He said, I hated every early morning workout I ever had in my entire career but I loved being world champion. You see, you don't have to like making prospecting calls. You don't have to like coming to the meeting. You don't have to like sitting here in the front row and agreeing with the speaker so that you're setting the example for everybody else. You don't have to like any of it, but you have to do it anyway. And when you do, you will separate yourself from everyone else. So get over the fact that you need to like it, okay? So, what follows choices? If we've got choices locked down, okay, I'm gonna start making new choices. What happens, has to happen after that? What has to happen after that is you gotta get your butt off the couch, go out the front door and make something happen. Behavior or action has to follow choices. So behavior, what you do with your choice is the next line of code in the operating system. Here's the biggest problem about your choices. 95% of the choices you make are unconscious. You're not even making a choice about it. You're literally sleepwalking through your day. Most of our behavior that we've developed over time are un or is unconscious to us. And so the first thing we need to do, I'll give you an example. Remember when you first learned to drive and you're trying to figure it out and you're like, okay, I have to put my hands at 10 o'clock and two o'clock and I gotta look over my left oh, indicator, my, my right mirror, the, the, the back mirror, this leg's gotta do this, this leg's gotta do this, and this hand's gotta do this, and you gotta do all these things simultaneously. You're like, ah, I'll never learn how to drive, right? All you could do is think about all these things that had to happen simultaneously. Well, what about today? Today you can drive, have a conversation, eat, apply your makeup, God forbid, use your phone, right? Have you ever been driving down the freeway, highway that you've got here and then all of a sudden you look up and you go, oh my God, I'm like three exits past where I was supposed to get off. You ever had that experience? You know what happened there? For the last three miles, 
You've been driving at 70 miles an hour, or however, kilometers it is an hour, completely brain dead, unconscious entirely as you were driving your car down the road. See, you don't have to think about it at all anymore. It has become an unconscious habit pattern. So the first thing that we need to do to change your behavior is we got to bring your awareness back to the behavior that you need to change. So I'll tell you when I first learned this. When I was 20 years of age, I got into the real estate business. And the first year in business, I did really well. And I'm meeting with my CPA, the accountant, to figure out my taxes. And he's pushing all these buttons and the tapes going like this. And he's giggling, laughing, having a good old time while I'm sitting there waiting for his ultimate results. And at the end, he says, congratulations, son. You owe over $100,000 in taxes. I said, I'm only 20 years old, right? He's like, I'm like, oh, I I don't have $100,000 just lying around. He's like, why? You earned several times that. Of course you set aside the money to pay your taxes. And I said, does this stupefied look indicate that I've saved the $100,000? And that's when he did a great favor. He pushed himself from his desk. He stood up and he pointed his finger at me and he said, son, you've got to stop it. I've seen this a hundred times. You keep on this, continue, this continued behavior and you will dig your financial grave with your own wallet. You've got to get a grip. And then he put his finger on what has become the most powerful personal development tool I've ever discovered. Now you have to know, I've been in the personal development industry for 20 years. I've seen, read, heard, been sent everything there is on the planet. And this is the most powerful. He put his finger on a 50 cent notepad and he slid it across the desk. And he said, son, I want you to write down every single penny you spend for the next 30 days. He said, I don't care if it's $2,000 for a new suit. You buy a pack of gum at the convenience store. You put 50 cents of air in your tires. You buy a round of drinks for your buddies. Everything goes on that notepad. And I said, yes, sir. And it wasn't but a week, week and a half after writing down everything that I was spending and then looking at it and went, oh my God, how money had just been pouring out of my pockets without me even knowing it. So I went from earning a lot of money to being worth a lot of money on the same amount of money because I changed my behavior and I didn't even know that my behavior was out of whack. So whatever you want to change, you want to change your diet, start writing down everything you put into your face. You want to change your fitness? Write down every exercise that you end up doing. You want to change your relationship with your spouse? Figure out what her or his love language is, and every time you do that, write it down. I'm telling you, you'll get an acute idea of exactly how your behavior has been off track and exactly what it takes to get it back on track. So awareness is the first step of change. The second day that changed my life is when I met my mentor, Jim Rohn, 1994, November. I'm in a seminar at the back of the room, and Jim at the front says, how many people here want to have more? And I raise my hand, yeah, I want to have more. I want to have a bigger business, more money, better relationships. Sure, I want to have more. And I'm thinking, what do I got to do now? Because I was already working 14, 16 hours a day. All I was doing was doing just grinding away at work. I'm thinking, what do I have to do now? So I'm ready to take notes, okay, now what? And he says, if you wanna have more, you have to become more. And I'd never heard that twist of logic. And he went on to explain, he said, look, success is not something you pursue. Success is not a doing process. He said, what it is that you pursue eludes you. It can be like trying to chase butterflies. It eludes you. He said, instead, success is something you attract by the person you become. So for things to change, you've got to change. For things to get better, you've got to get better. And when you improve, everything and all your results improve around you. And so I remember when I was 29 years of age and I'm ready to get married, okay? And so it was a rainy weekend. I was living in Dallas at the time. And I decided I'm just going to take this journal and I'm just going to write down everything that I want in a woman. Great detail, okay? I mean, kind of food she likes, kind of art she likes, kind of music she likes, kind of place she likes to travel, right? The kind of, the, the, how she wanted to raise children, 
um, down to the texture of her hair, the color of her eyes, everything. I filled out 40 pages of my ideal woman. And I remember reading it going, yeah, that's my woman, right? And then I'm thinking, what do I got to do to get this girl? And then I heard Jim Rohn's voice in the back of my head. He said, what you pursue will elude you. Instead, it's who you have to become. So I started by asking myself two questions. I asked this question. I said, based on the woman that I described on these 40 pages, what kind of a man does she want for herself? And I started to write down all the attributes of what this quality woman would want in a quality man. And then the second question I asked myself is, what is the difference between me and that man? And all the ways that I need to grow and improve in order to become that man attracted to and worthy of this woman. And so I don't really know exactly how this works, okay? Some things are, as Jim would put it, mysteries of the mind. But I'm telling you as if she were peeled off the pages of my journal. Three years into our marriage, I found the journal and I had her read it. And she was, she was shocked about how specifically it detailed her. If I had showed it to her at the beginning, she would have ran away scared. But it was specifically detailing her. So now let me translate this for you, okay? What kind of people do you want to recruit into your ACN business? What are those attributes that you're looking for in the ideal representative for your business? It's important to make a list. Who do you want? What attributes? What qualities? What characteristics? Are they passionate? Are they energetic? Are they disciplined? Are they consistent? Are they loyal? Do they have integrity? What are those attributes? Make a long list, and then here's what I want you to do. Ask yourself this. What kind of a sponsor, what kind of a leader would this person be attracted to and want to be in business with? And then ask yourself, based on who I am now, how I walk, talk, dress, show up, where's the gap between me and this person? You'll now know how you need to become in order to attract the kind of people that you truly want in your ACN business. It's as simple as that. It's not a pursuit. It's not a doing. It's a you becoming and being worthy and attractive to the kind of people you want in your business. Now, <laughs> behavior repeated become habits. Now I'm telling you, this is the key point. Choices that you start acting on ultimately need to become habits. Your habits will determine your life and lifestyle. If I watch you for a couple of few days and I notice your habits, I can guess your bank account within a few euro. I can predict your future. I can tell you the kind of relationships you have now and the kind of relationships you will have later when I observe your habits. Because habits are the expressions of who we are and how we live and they determine all your results. So this is ultimately what we want to change is changing your habits. Now a habit is something when you repeat a behavior, you develop inside your brain what's called a neurosignature. Or let's just make it less technical. Your brain is like gray matter, totally malleable, okay? You come into this world with no habits, none. You develop them over time with your repeated behavior. And it develops what's called a brain groove. And once you have that brain groove, once it's deep enough, now you can perform that act without ever having to think about it. That's how you can, 95% of your behavior becomes unconscious. And these habits, they start out like cobwebs and they become thick as cables, as the Spanish proverb says. Now, the hard reality about changing your habits are good habits. Like I have good habits, meaning I have to work out, okay? I don't like it, but I have to do it. Like even here at the, at, while I've been staying in Barcelona, I've been to the gym four times because I have to get this, my body has to feel 
it, it's, it exercising. It's a, it's a healthy habit, right? Habits are both good as well as bad. Well, good habits, they're hard to create, but easy to lose. You go on a two week vacation and don't run or work out, it's gonna be really hard to start back up again when you get home. The other side of this equation is, bad habits are easy to create and hard to lose. You on a vacation with a friend who has this particular drink they like and you start drinking it and then you come home and you're still drinking it and all of a sudden you're like, wow, I got this new habit that I never even wanted and it's hard to break. What happens here is when you try to break one of the neurosignatures in your brain of a bad habit, it's as difficult as if you have substance abuse, drugs and alcohol that you're trying to go through withdrawals to get over. As physical, emotional, and psychological, it'll be as painful as that. It's kind of like this. Imagine you jumped in a river that was flowing in one direction. You could just jump in and with no effort be carried down the river. But let's say that you decide to go up the river and you turn around and now you're fighting with everything you've got. All your energy is expended and maybe you're only moving a couple of inches. That's what it's gonna be like when you start fighting your existing bad habits. It's not gonna be easy. You will have to, with everything you've got, all the willpower and discipline you've got, fight, 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 and only make inches of progress. And ultimately, it'll take about 300 repetitions of not doing the previous bad habit and doing the new good habit so that this one weakens and this one strengthens. Now that you know, it's not going to be easy and how long you've got to sustain a new habit, at least you won't get disillusioned, okay? And the reality is, is that willpower will not work. Why is it that we have the biggest diet industry in the history of humanity and yet as a species, we are more fat than we've ever been in the history of humanity? How can those two things exist simultaneously? And the reason is, they all rely on willpower, and willpower will not work. So instead, what I want to encourage you to find is what's called why power. So imagine I took up a 300-foot steel beam, and I laid it across the concrete floor here. And I said, hey, if you just walk on top of the beam from one side to the other, at the other I'll give you 20 euro for walking on top of it. How many people would do it? Yeah, easy 20 euro, no big deal. But what if I took that 300 foot steel beam and I put it atop two 100 story buildings? And now I said, if you walk on top of the beam from one side to the other, I'll give you 20 euro. How many people would do it now? But what if on the other building is your child and the building is on fire? And if you don't go across that beam, they will perish and die right before your eyes. How many people will go across that beam now? I did have one person in the front row say, um, I have two children, which child is over there? And I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Now, I, I just want you to observe something here, okay? The first time I asked you, you said, no way, no how, the risk, the danger's too great. Why would I ever do that? The second time I asked you, you shot your hand up and I didn't even offer you 20 euro. The difference was the reason why to do it. Here's what I want you to get. When your reason why is urgent enough, important enough, critical enough, where you have a white hot burning desire to get to the other side, no danger, no risk, nothing can stop you. In order for you to achieve, in order for you to achieve the kind of goals that you're capable of achieving, what's stopping you is you don't have enough reasons that are urgent, powerful, and compelling enough to have you come overcome any danger, risk, or fear that you've got to getting there. And you will need this why power to sustain the changing of your habits. So that's the reason why inside 
the Living Your Best Year Ever, which is the goal achievement system I've used since I was 18 years old. And it's responsible for several million dollars of income of learning how to achieve goals. One of the most important things that's covered in there is finding your reason why, discovering it, articulating it, getting clarity on it. Now, it's important that you figure out what your bad habits are and that you uproot them from your life and you figure out what success habits you need and install them. So this is the question you have to ask yourself. What are the bad habits that are sabotaging my success? Is it gossiping? Is it watching too much television? Is it eating poorly? Is it uh, not being consistent? Is it lack of discipline? What is it? And what success habits do you need to install to accomplish your goals? And inside the compound effect, I'll outline five strategies for you to uproot these bad habits because you've got to yank them from your life. They keep derailing you. They keep distracting you from your potential. So how to uproot them, and then seven ways to install the success habits that you need. Install them deeply into your day-to-day -day methodology so that you can stay on track and keep the trajectory you want for your life, okay? So you'll find that inside the compound effect. But I want to leave you with something that you can start applying right now immediately. Okay, how to build your success system. I call it my massive transformation formula because in three points, I'll show you how to create a massive transformation for your life. If you want to have a very different life than the one you're leading right now, one that's actually equivalent to your true potential, which is way beyond where you're living right now, this is all it takes, okay? Let me outline it for you. Number one is this. Figure out what your big three goals in life are. Okay, I don't care whether you got 50 goals, 100 goals, 1,000 places you want to see before you die, 50 places on your bucket list. Set all that aside. What are the three most important goals you've got for your life for this year that if you accomplish them, this would be the best year of your life? So you might say, okay, well, if it's going to be big goals, if I accomplish this, that'd be pretty good. But I've had some pretty big years, so if I accomplish this and that, okay, wow. But if I accomplish this, this, and that, this would by far be the best year of my life. That's all you need. Take everything else, set it aside. Those are your big three. Number two is this. What are those couple of key behaviors most important to each goal to accomplishing them? This is where the transformation comes in. You're only one or two key behaviors away from a massive transformation in any area of your life. You wanna change your marriage? There's probably one or two key behaviors that would create a massive transformation. You want to change your sales? There's probably one or two key behaviors that would change your results in a massive way. So the key is to figure out what those are. Now, they're not 5,000 behaviors or functions. It always comes down to about a half dozen. So I want to give you the half dozen key behaviors necessary for you to Become a circle of champion here at ACN. Wayne outlined four of them for you earlier. So I want to make sure that you get it. Like you really understand. This is all you have to do. This is your job description. This is your business plan. This is your day-to-day -day method of operation. So I'm going to give it to you right here, right? Number one is this. Use all the services and all the products that are available here through ACN. You can't promote or sell what it is you don't use or eat, okay? You have to become the living example of ACN. So you have to use it all, eat it all, try it all. That's number one, okay, simple. Just use the dang products, no big deal. Number two is you then have to take what your results and what your experience has been and share that recommendation and example and testimonial with other people. So talk about the services, talk about the products to other people. Number three, if they go, hey, I really like this new nutrition bar too, or hey, I really like what these services offer, and you say, great, you know, if you told a couple other people like I told you, you could actually make some part-time income. So share the opportunity, that's number three. Number four, if they go, wow, I, I really would like to do this, how do I get started? You sit down and you help them get started. That's it, that's number four. Number five, attend, as you're doing right now, and build for events. 
You're in the event business. Your whole career will be going from one event to the next so that you can drive large volumes of people and keep them motivated, inspired, and educated, and, and, and empowered. So you're in the event business. And then number six is <clears throat> your own personal development. Because remember, if you want your life and results to improve, what has to happen? You have to improve. For things to change, for things to get better, you have to get better. And when you get better, everything in your life gets better with you. That's it, everybody. That's your business plan. You want to have a strategic planning, meaning what you got to do day in and day out? That's it. Use them, share them, help them. Get to the next event, grow. That's it. That's your life at ACN. <coughs> so, now that we've identified that, the third is the key. This is where we start to create a gyroscope for your life. And that is tracking those behaviors. That's it, track them. So inside the Living Your Best Year Ever program, there's a sheet there, it's called the Weekly Rhythm Register. Remember I told you I'd give you a gyroscope so that you can manage your whole life on a single piece of paper. So all you do is you take your top six behaviors, share the services, share the opportunity, follow up, attend meetings, number of new people that you want at the meetings, and your personal development. And on Sunday, today, all you do is say, how many times am I gonna do each one of these behaviors? That's it. Okay, I'm gonna share the services and products with 10 people throughout the week. I'm gonna share the opportunity with five people. I'm gonna follow up with five people from last week. I'm going to bring two new people to the meeting and I'm gonna do 30 minutes of uh, personal development, two times listening, two times reading. That's it. it. Takes you less than 30 seconds to plan out your week. And at the end of each day, you simply just go, check, check, uh-oh, check, uh-oh, check. And at the end of the week, you simply just add it up. Are you on track or off track? And if you're off track, what do you do? Get back on track. Because see, what happens is, is people end up drifting. They don't fall off their success plan, they just drift. So as you guys go back to your markets, go back to your homes, you're gonna be all excited because this is exciting stuff. What you've learned here, the opportunity you have at your feet, you're gonna be all excited. And if you don't continually track your key behaviors, you'll drift. And you'll end up at the next conference and go, why did I not get the results that I wanted? You just didn't do the easy things because they're easy not to do. They're not easy not to do when you are tracking them day in and day out. By the way, I'll give you a blank copy of that rhythm register. You can copy it off as many times as you want and you can use it for you and your organization, okay? So that'll be slint with the slides as well. So what's the last line? What's the last line of code to complete your world-class operating system? It really is just about time. The time to compound the consistency of these new choices. Simple as that. But here's the big warning. This is the pitfall. This is what will cause you to fail and blunder more than anything else. At the same time, if you master this skill, you can beat anybody in this room to this stage, to the top of this organization. This is the one attribute that when anybody asks me what I would attribute my success to, this is it. Here's what it is. It's not how fast you start. See, at the start of the race, everybody's there. Right here, when you all go back to your markets, everybody's gonna be excited. It really doesn't, it's not gonna be about what you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now I encourage you to go after it, but that's not ultimately gonna determine where you end up to get to this stage. It's not how fast you start, it's how long you last. Because in the, re in the end, you've heard the old fable, the tortoise and the hare, right? Well, the hare is more experienced, the hare is faster, the hare is more skilled, but the tortoise beats it every time because it's relentlessly consistent. And you will win every single time if you just stay the course. Consistency wins every time. Now, I wanna give you one last strategy. I get asked all the time after this, is there any way to speed this up a little bit? And the reality is, Time has to take its course. 
But there is one strategy that can accelerate your success, okay? That can get you far beyond the pack, to have you break out from the peloton, so to speak. And here's what it is. I learned it when I first got into real estate. I went to a seminar. It's kind of a theme there. And I was the only guy that asked the lecturer to lunch. And so we went to lunch and I sat down with him and I'm only 20 years of age right now, okay? And I'm in the real estate business and just getting started. And I said, tell me what I gotta do to be successful. I says, I'm willing to do anything. He says, are you really, really willing to do anything? I said, I'm willing to do anything. He says, then I'm gonna give you the ultimate key to your success. I'm like, I'm ready. He said, go fail. I said, what do you, what do you mean go fail? He says, yeah, go fail fast, go fail a lot, and go fail really big. And I thought, man, isn't the whole idea of success avoiding failure? And he said, no, 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 it's quite the opposite. The key to your success is your failure. And then he gave me this quote from Thomas Watson, who used to be the president of IBM, where he said, your key to success is massive failure. Now, don't just hear that as some motivational line. Let that marinate on your brain a little bit. The key to success is massive failure. What if that's true? Now, based on the look on your faces, same look I had on my face, okay? So he explained this to me a little bit. He took a cocktail napkin and he drew out this analogy. He said, look, on one side of the pendulum is joy, love, happiness, and success. The other side is pain, rejection, sadness, and failure. He says, look, if, if you just stand still, you won't experience any pain, rejection, sadness, and defeat, but you won't experience any joy, love, happiness, and success either. He says, you, you know, you can't live under a bridge. Eventually you gotta go and mix amongst people. So what ends up happening is, is people are only willing to experience so much rejection and so much pain and so much defeat, and so they only experience so much joy, so much love, and they end up just operating in what is called this comfort zone. And if anything is outside that comfort zone, they're like, oh, no, no. And they just stay right here in this comfort zone. But they complain, why don't I have more success? Why don't I have more love? Why don't I have more happiness in my life? He said, so you can't push the pendulum on the side of success. He must have went to a Jim Rohn seminar. What you pursue will elude you. He said, the only side of the pendulum you can control is the side of pain, rejection, sadness, and defeat. So your job is to go push the pendulum as high, as wide, and as fast as you can on the side of pain, rejection, sadness, and defeat. And he says, I promise you, it'll swing in equal proportion on the other side. So I just took his word for it. So I just pursued it with reckless abandon, okay? So here I was. just getting started in real estate. And I said, where can I go get as much failure, pain, sadness, and defeat as much as possible, right? So there are these things called expired listings. These are people who had their house on the market with another realtor. It didn't sell. And all these realtors call them at the same time. And then the homeowner gets really mad and angry and upset. And when you call those people, they just let you have it with all this anger, madness, and being upset. So lots of pain and rejection to be had there. I did that every morning. Then when I was done with that, I went and called on these people who are the scariest people on the planet to a realtor. And these are people who are called for sale by owners or FISBOs. These people hate realtors so much they wouldn't even think of listing their house with one of them. You go knock on their door and they open the door. Lots of pain, rejection, and sadness to be had there. Then I would park my car at the end of a street, take a little notepad, put 50 check boxes on it. And I would just go door to door knocking, do you plan on buying or selling a house in the next six months? Door would slam in my face. People would yell at me from across the street. Kids would throw rocks. It would start raining. Every time somebody rejected me, how did I feel? Happy, one more checkbox from being done. This stuff sucks, right? Then I would go back to my office and 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. is what I called money time. And that is when I just cold called people on the phone. And it was the perfect time because they were all home having dinner. And people love to be interrupted on the phone when they're having dinner, right? Lots of pain and rejection to be had there. So what happened was, 
because all day, every day, I was just subjecting myself to constant pain, constant rejection, and constant failure, as he promised, the pendulum swung in equilibrium on the other side. In 90 days, in an office of 44 agents, not knowing anything about the real estate business, I had more new listings and more new escrows than the entire office combined. At the end of the first year, was doing more than the number two and number three agent in the office, number one in the city, number one in the county the next year. And it all had to do with this strategy, which was out failing everybody else around me. Now, even to this day, even to this day, if I get to the end of the month and I've not had some embarrassing defeat, rejection, or failure, I'm mad at myself. Why? Because I want more success than I have right now. Well, what is the key to that? More failure. So all you cushy, comfy, successful circle of champions, now's the time to push that pendulum even higher and wider. More failure, more defeat, more rejection. I want you to change your mindset about failure, about rejection, about defeat. I want you to learn to love it. I got to the point where I loved failure. I mean, I sought it. I, every day I pursued more and more. And the more I got, the more I celebrated it. You see, when you turn fear into fun, fear no longer has a grip on you. Here's what I know about you. Here's what I know. <clears throat> the only thing stopping you from being more successful, from realizing your potential, because your potential is so much greater than your current life, the only thing stopping you is fear. It's fear. And when you turn fear into fun, you release that potential. You're unstoppable. Nothing can stop you. So here's what I want you to do when you go back on Monday. Don't write out the number of new people you can recruit in the business, the number of new products that you can sell. Instead, I want you to create a hundred no club. Who can get to a hundred no's the fastest? Have a competition and then see who wins. And then there's a booby prize, which is who has the most embarrassing, ugly, heart-wrenching story of defeat or embarrassment. And then that person you carry around on your shoulders and celebrate them. Okay, because here's what happens. What you resist persists. What you step into dissipates. Once you step into the thing you once feared, it dissipates. And now you can finally live up to the potential that you, you are been given by God but are not living as you were meant to live. Look at this guy, the ultimate failure. His personal motto, motto is, Screw it, let's do it. If you fall flat on your face, pick yourself up and try again. This is a guy worth $4 billion. The only thing different between you and Richard Branson is he is a much bigger failure than you are. Simple as that. Eleanor Roosevelt said it this way. Do something every day that scares you. At the end of every day, that's the question I ask myself. Did I do something today that scared me? Because if I did, I push that pendulum just a little bit and I'm going to see the reward on the other side of that swing. The last thing I want to encourage you to do is, you've been to conferences before, you've made decisions before, you've made resolutions before, you've set goals before, but this time, this time I want you to draw a line in the sand, a figurative line in the sand. Before you get up from your chair, I want you to draw a line in the sand. And this time I want you to say, this is it. If there's one attribute of the greatest successful people that I know, it's this sense of resolve. I will do it or I will die trying. Because when you go back, you're going to be faced with your mountain in life, building your ACN business, getting to the circle of champions at the top. And you're going to start climbing it and you're going to be struggling as you climb it and people are going to come out of the woodwork and go, what are you doing climbing mountains? You don't know how to climb mountains. Look, you have a good job. You're lucky to even have a job in this economy. Get off that mountain before you hurt yourself. I'm here to try to protect you. And you're gonna have to look them in the eye and go, you see this mountain? 
This is my mountain. I'm going to the top. You'll climb a little bit further and people who say they love you and support you will come out and say, wait a minute. I, I, I read a little something about that mountain. I think that mountain's a pyramid, right? That mountain, there's a, that, that's, that's a scammy mountain. Now, I'm trying to protect you. I'm just trying to be your friend here. People on Facebook will come out of the woodwork and you're gonna have to look them in the eye and you say, you see this mountain? I'm going to the top. And then as you start to ascend and you're almost at the summit, this is what cracks me up. People out of the woodwork will go, okay, okay. If you're so intent on climbing mountains, you should climb this mountain because this mountain is better. Our compensation plan is faster. This is the better plan for you. And you're gonna have to look each of those people in the eye and say, you see this mountain? This is my mountain. And you're either gonna see me waving from the top or laying dead on the side. I am not coming back. With that sense of resolve, nothing can stop you. ACN, I love you. Great to be with you. Thank you guys.